good morning, Rocky Peak. How are you today? Yeah. About two-thirds of you still in recovery, I see, from the Thanksgiving holiday. Excellent. We're going to have a good time this morning. My name's Joel. I'm on the staff team here. Before we jump into our time of teaching, I wanted to make sure that you were aware that our annual end-of-year letter that our lead pastor, Michael, will write and send out, that went out this last week. And so it might be in your inbox, it might be in your mailbox, or you may not even know about it. So just want to make sure you're aware. That's a great way for you to be kept in the loop of the things that are going on in the life of our church, where we're ending up this year financially, all sorts of good things. And so if you didn't get it, there's going to be some hard copies for you out in the lobby or on the patio, depending on how the wind is going. Uh, and if you would like to sign up for that, you can do that. Go to our website, rockypeak.org. Uh, we'd love to just keep you in the loop so you're aware of what's going on in the life of our church. And I know like some of you might be guests, brand new people for the very first time with family or friends, and so I just want to give a special welcome to you. Glad that you could be with us this weekend, and I hope it's a good time. So we're going to jump into our time of teaching right now, and so in those programs that you got in your way, and there's some message notes that will help you follow along, and we're going to be continuing in our series in the book of Romans in just a minute. But before we jump into the things we're going to see Paul's unpacking today, I want to pull us back a little bit in first century history to this day in the life of Jesus. And it takes place in, in John's account in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 6. And what we're going to see in this moment is, that's going on is Jesus is mixing it up once again, and he's, he's just getting tangled, he's getting saucy, he's getting spicy with, the, with a group of people in his day, and, and yet what's interesting about this moment is that it's not the usual suspects, the, those with whom are going to have an issue with what he's been talking about in this moment, they're not the religious leaders, normally it is the Pharisees, the Sadducees, it's, it's that crew that don't like Jesus. What's fascinating about this moment is the ones who are going to take issue with what he has to say are some of his own followers. And John 6 is a, is a fascinating chapter. Here's like just the, the, the quick note of it. It starts off with Jesus having this crowd of people come gather around him one day. And so they realize, hey, we don't have enough food. And so Jesus is like, no problem, I'll take care of it. He feeds like thousands of people. This miracle happens. People are like amazed. It's this awesome day. It'll be like, you know, like you go to Burning Man and no one has food. And then Jesus shows up and like, happy meals for everyone. And be like, like, that was like the, the extent of it. Like, what is this? And people are just, and so then Jesus sends his disciples to go to the other side of the lake and he's going to deal with the crowds. And then he goes up into the, the, mil, the, the mountains, the hills to pray to the father. And then he wants to catch up with his guys that are out on the middle of the lake now and they're caught up in a storm. And then if you're Jesus, no big deal. You just walk out to them to catch up to them. And this blows their minds and freaks them out. And so like his own disciples had seen him do these incredible miraculous things so much in just a short window of time. And and so then they get to their side of the lake, and then the crowds are like, where's the Happy Meals? And so they make their way around the lake to find Jesus. And then Jesus sees the crowds coming, and he begins to talk and teach them. And he says, like, hey, you're coming to me for food that doesn't last. He's like, but I, I'm actually the bread of life. Like, I, I've come down from heaven. And he starts to reference the, the idea of manna in the, in the stories of their people from long ago, that God provided manna to, to, to give them sustenance in their wilderness days. And, and he's like, I'm the manna that's come down from heaven. And then he just begins to say some really interesting things that, that are just kind of blowing people's minds. And he's like, hey, no one can come to me unless the Father enables them. And he says things like, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of the life I've come to give you. And now you can just imagine, like, that, that, that sounds weird today. But back then, that was especially weird because they hadn't yet seen the cross and the resurrection and this thing called communion, the things that Jesus was foreshadowing. And, and the point that he's making is that unless you take part in my life, you will have no life. And so now people are wrestling with this. And, and in the middle of this conversation, some of his disciples are like, ah, Jesus, I don't know if I'm... I'm following along. And so this is what we read in John 6, verse 60. It says this, on hearing it, on hearing all this teaching that he had just done, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Have you ever wrestled with the things that Jesus has said? As a follower, hey, I, if you would say that you're a follower of Jesus and you've never been challenged by what Jesus has said, you might actually not be taking him seriously enough. Because I guarantee you, he will challenge your thinking and your life if you are brave enough to take him seriously. And so they're wrestling with them in this moment. And so aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, 
I'm so sorry. I didn't know I was making it too difficult. How do I make it easier for you? <laughs> like, no. Look at what he says. Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Like, like, what if you see me in all of my glory? You recognize that I'm so much more than what you figured out so far. Would that be enough to convince you that I have the right and the authority to tell you the things I'm telling you? See, the Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. That's called a sheep thinning sermon. Like, like here's Jesus, and he's just, he's just speaking truth to them, and they can't handle it. And it's amazing because he's, he's literally trying to offer them life. And yet it's really hard to grab on to the life that's being offered to you when you want to do it your own way. And this was their tension, and this was their wrestle. And, and, and this always strikes me as I read this because I think like this idea of the gospel, this thing that we've been unpacking in this series in Romans, the gospel, the good news of what God has done for us in and through Jesus that radically changes our lives. Like, has anyone here had their life impacted by the reality of the gospel? Anyone here had your story turned around and transformed because Jesus showed up and sent you on a whole new path? Like, it's amazing, and yet, oftentimes I think, well, if I could have just lived in the time of Jesus, it would be so much easier than it is for me now. And then I look at this group of people here, and I'm like, oh, maybe not. And yet, as amazing as the gospel is, this good news, even though it's good news, it is challenging to embrace. And I think one of the reasons why it's so challenging to embrace is that the gospel forces us to face the truth about ourselves. And that is that we are serious pieces of work. And if you have any doubt about that, just ask the people you spent this week with, family and friends. I'm sure they would be happy to let you know. <laughs> and yet that, that is a bitter pill to swallow at times, isn't it? And yet here's the hope of what we find when we encounter Jesus. Because Jesus said these words. He said, if you will hold to my teaching." you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And see, that's the hope that no matter how big of a piece of work I am, there's hope in my story because Jesus came for pieces of work like me to offer life, to lead us into something greater and better. And so let's not miss what he has for us today as we crack open this book and see what these words that can bring us into life. So let's pray as we just get started because if it's just my words, no, no big deal. But if we're looking at God's words, very big deal. And so, Lord, we want to come in this moment and just acknowledge, first and foremost, we need you. You said, follow me. You didn't say, can you follow us? And so that means that from the start, we need to turn our heart and our mind and our thoughts and our eyes to you. And so would you help us to hear what you want to say today? Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see. Would we not miss the truth that could set us free today as we step into this moment with you? So thank you that you are good, that you pursue, that you are willing to offend for our good. So don't let us miss it today. Amen, amen. So we're gonna jump back into Romans, this series that we've been in. Romans is a book written in the first century by one of the early Christian leaders, a man named Paul. And so if you're brand new, we've been in the book of Romans a really long time, uh, and we're only cracking into chapter four, which means we're gonna be in the book of Romans a really long time, but we're, we're, we're taking our time working through it because what we have in this book is, is the heart of one of the early Christian leaders, a man named Paul, who experienced the power of the gospel in his own life. 
And he's writing to a group of Christians living in the city of Rome. And he's writing this letter as a letter of introduction because he wants to come and visit them at some point in his story, in his journey. And so he's writing to just kind of lay the foundation of, hey, this is what it means to belong to Jesus. This is what it means to follow him. And so he, we've been just working our way through Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3. And so today we're going to jump into Romans 4. Michael's going to come back next week and he's going to wrap up the end of chapter 3 for us. But I, I just want to keep moving us down the field a little bit. So we're going to jump into Romans for. And we're going to see what Paul has to say here as we look at this. And so this is what we read, Romans 4, verse 1. He says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? Okay, so like, Paul, what, what are you talking about? So Paul, Paul is anticipating a yeah, but that's going to be coming his way in light of everything he had just been laying down in the previous chapter in chapter 3. So in chapter three, Paul's talking about this incredible thing that God does, that that there's this justification, that this way of being made right with God that has nothing to do with our effort or our earning it. It's God's gift to us. God gives us his righteousness and it comes through faith. So let's just unpack it. Let's not miss what Paul was saying. So go back into chapter three, go to verse 21. And this is what Paul is trying to now respond to a possible yeah, but. So in verse 21 of chapter three, Paul says these words, but now apart from the law, And so he's talking about like the law, like the Old Testament law. So think like the Ten Commandments, right? And so the reason God had given the law was to give a a picture of what a righteous life would look like. Like if we were actually living life the way we were supposed to, here's the things that we would do and here's the things that we wouldn't be doing. And have you ever just wondered like, God, why did you set the bar so high? Because it just seems really impossible. And then you look at the Ten Commandments and you're like, maybe it's not that high. Like, you know, like don't kill people. You're like, don't steal, don't cheat, don't lie. Don't even want to do those things. Hey, there's only one God. Worship the only God. Don't, don't worship mud, right? Like, you're like, okay, so maybe the, maybe the problem isn't that the bar is high. Maybe the problem is that I'm just, I just suck at it. Maybe the point is for me to recognize I need help. I need help in the story, right? And so the good news is what Paul's saying here. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. And this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And so as Paul is expounding on this, he's now anticipating in Romans 4 a yeah, but that's going to be coming his way, and most likely from his fellow Jewish people who had been raised their whole life to be good, to be righteous by their performance and their living up to the law. And so Paul's like blowing their minds. It's not about your performance. It's about what's been done for you. It's about faith in Jesus. And so some of them are like, well, no, 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 but, but, but we go, like our spiritual lineage goes all the way back to this guy, Abraham. That's where our whole story starts. And Abraham was righteous because he did what God told him to do. And so Paul's anticipating the Abba. And so back in chapter four, he says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? What did Abraham discover about this idea of faith? So if, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, right? And so that would be the thought. That that would have been the common thought back then. Like Abraham, well, like if you know the story of Abraham in Genesis, Genesis, early stories in Genesis, God shows up to this guy, Abram. He changes his name to Abraham in time, but he's like, Abram, through you, I want to do something epic. Through you, I'm going to bless all generations. Through you, I'm actually going to bring around around the promise of rescue that I made to the human race at the end of chapter three. Through you, I'm going to bring the Messiah. Through you, I'm going to bring rescue and restoration. Abraham, through you, I'm going to have a best-selling book. It's going to be amazing. Like you're you're the guy and I'm going to bless you and through your generation and your family, I'll I'll bless all people. And so he says, Abraham, I want you to leave your family, leave everything you know and walk with me into a land you know nothing about. And then Abraham, I'm making a commitment to you, a covenant between you that will be for all people. And the sign of the covenant is that you're going to get circumcised, which again is like a tough sell. (laughs) Like, okay, can we, other options, please? You know, all these things. And so like, but Abraham responds. 
And so like even there in in this moment, they're like, yeah, see, like our father Abraham, he was righteous because he did the things that God wanted him to do. And, and, And Paul's like, no, but remember, he existed before the law, before the law was ever given. So what was it that he did that was good? And so you read in Genesis chapter 15, there's this moment where Abraham, some time has gone by and, the, and the, the promise hasn't been answered yet of a son who would come to Abraham, a lineage, a, a family tree that would be started. And, and Abraham's really wrestling with this. Like, God, like, it looks like everything you promise isn't happening. Everything I have is gonna go to my servant. Like, this doesn't seem right. And, and God just kind of shows up and he's like, dude, calm down. Like, just calm down. Let's go for a little walk outside. And he's like, look at the night sky. How many stars do you see, Abraham? He's like, that's how many generations you're gonna have. That's, that's what your lineage is gonna be like, like the stars in the sky. And it says that Abraham believed God. And so this is what Paul's pointing them back to now in the story in chapter four. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. Why? Verse three, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Like the point that Paul's making is you go back to the very early story, even in the life of Abraham, and you realize that Abraham was living a life of faith because Abraham wasn't righteous because of the things he did. He was righteous because he trusted God. And God gave him righteousness as a result of that. And so what you see in the story there in Genesis 15, if you want to read it on your own, You see that Paul takes us back to these scriptures to point this out, and that Abraham's belief preceded his behavior. And so what you see is that all his behavior was was proof of his belief. And so it's this idea then that Abraham was credited righteousness because it was his faith. And it's important that we understand the point Paul's trying to make because he's using Abraham now as an example to not simply respond to the yeah, but, but to point out, yeah, because he lived a life of faith. And that is so important if we're going to understand what Paul just wrote in Romans 3. Because Romans 3.22, this righteousness is given through what? Faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So the way we step into the life that God has for us isn't our, our performance. It isn't by trying to be good enough. It's by trusting in what Jesus has done for us. And so Paul goes on in verses four and five, and he says, now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Right? And so the point, again, Paul's making is like, hey, if this was based on our effort, our performance, if, if our righteousness was based on the things that we did, our own work, then we could demand from God that he gives us the life we want. But if this righteousness is not based on what we've done, but it's based on what another has done for us, then all we can do is put our trust in that person to give it to us. And that's the beautiful hope then of discovering Jesus. I'm gonna put my hope in you. And so Paul, he just wants to keep building the case. And so he says, verse six, David says the same thing. So now he points to David, like the most famous king in all of Israel. This is the guy that killed Goliath. Like if you know all the stories, like this is the guy that was just like maybe the most preeminent king Israel ever had in their history. And he's like, hey, David even talks about this. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. And so he quotes one of David's ancient Psalms. He says, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. I I don't know about you, but I've like accumulated some stuff in my story. Anyone else have accumulated some stuff in your story? Yeah, like you can elbow them if they're not telling the truth right now. But like, but yeah, and, and, like, and I look at that and I'm like, like, God, like there's some good stuff. Like I would love to get the paycheck for the good stuff, but there's some other stuff over here. I would really not like that paycheck. And what the, what the, what's the point that David's pointing out is like, how blessed are you when God doesn't count your sins against you, but instead gives you his righteousness? I mean, that's the blessed life. Forget the American dream. The blessed life is a life of grace and mercy and forgiveness. That's the life I want. 
That's the life I want to chase after. And yeah, it's interesting as you look at what David's saying here. I just want a quick little sidebar. I think it, it creates a serious question for us to ponder because he says, blesses the one who, who sins God doesn't count against them, which causes me to ask the question, why would God count our sins against us? It seems heavy, right? Like if you're just like, hey, God, are you keeping score? Like, do you have a list and you're checking it twice? You're going to find out who's not here nice? Like, because like, that's what it sounds like the implications of this would be, which is why I'm blessed if that list isn't counted against me. So, but like, why, why, why would God do that? Like, why can't God just kind of just forgive and like, you know, like I, I spilt the milk, God, I'm sorry. Like, can't we just move on? And, and I think the reason we have to, we got to wrestle with that because if we, if we say something like, why can't God just forgive? Like, what, what does that mean when we say something like that? It sounds like what we're saying is like, hey, God, would you turn a blind eye to what's wrong? And in my case, just go, ah, shucks. Ah, Joel, there you go again. Because you know when I want God to do that? When I've screwed up. You know when I don't want God to do that? When you screwed up towards me, (laughs) right? Because what I want in those moments, I want a God who is just. I want a God who will deal with the wrongs in this world. Like, could you imagine, like, like somebody just horribly wronged your family, did some horrible things, and they got caught, and they go to court, and this is sentin- sentencing day, and, and then the judge is like, you little man, ah, ha, 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 don't do that anymore. Like, you'd be furious. Like, where's the justice? See, and that, that's that idea, like, like, God cannot just forgive because there's a debt that has to be settled. There's something wrong that has taken place. Our sin resulted in a consequence that has serious implications. And this is what we see in the opening story in the scriptures. When God created us as a race and put us in the garden and set us free in the world, and he said, you're free to enjoy everything in this creation I've given you, just not this one thing, because I don't want this for you. I did not create you to know the burden and the pain of good and evil. So this tree represents that, so stay away from it. And then the very next chapter, what do we see? Our parents are camped out, hanging by the tree. And then the serpent shows up and deceives. I mean, it's a very deep story. We're not gonna get into all of it, but God had warned them, the day you do this one thing I ask you not to do is the day you will die. And see, when our first parents didn't trust God, when they believed the deceiver, they died. In Hebrew, the word death, it simply means this, separation. And that's exactly what they experienced in that moment. A death in their relationship between one another, there was separation. A death in their relationship with God, there was separation. And then they would be sent out of the garden as an act of mercy so they wouldn't live in immortality and death. (laughs) And so they eventually experienced a physical death. But that's the consequence. That's the thing. And here's the thing. The only way we can ever pay our debt would be to live in perpetual separation for all of eternity. Because I can't pay my debt. I'm already dead. Someone else has to pay that debt. And that's the beautiful gift then. The hope of the gospel is that God pays off our debt through the gift of Jesus which is why we'll see when we get to Romans 5, Paul writes these words, Romans 5, 8. He says, God demonstrates his love for us in this way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So go back to the, to the cross. Go back to the night that Jesus was being executed. Do you remember what he cried out to the father as he was hanging on the cross? The words, the heavy words, the words of anguish. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me. Because in that moment, Jesus experienced separation. Jesus experienced our death so that through him, we could have the hope of new life. And now through his death and resurrection, we can step into new life with him. Which is why when Jesus says the words, follow me, he's not inviting us on like a nice walk on the beach in Malibu. Follow me, come out of death into life. Listen to my words as I guide you into the life you were created for, as I call you out of brokenness. When I say we go left, we go left because mine is the path of life. I'll put my spirit in you and I will guide you. See, Jesus calls us to follow him so we can come out of death into life. And so here's the offer on the table for all of us today that Paul's been unpacking 
It's this idea that we all stand guilty before God. And yet our hope is that God justifies us and makes us righteous as we step into new life with Jesus by faith. Jesus, I'm trusting that what you've done for me is enough. And so now wherever you go, I'm running after you. I want the life that you have for me. And yet this life of faith, though simple to grasp, it's not always easy to live, is it? Like, have you noticed that? Like, it's not always easy to follow Jesus because I still have my own desires. I still want to do it my way. Am I the only one who wants to do it his own way? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. all right, all right, yeah, yeah. Good, I was getting worried. I thought I was with a bunch of holy people. I was like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. And yet, there's this hope on the table if we will embrace it, if we will chase it, but it's not always easy to do that. And I think there's times when we find it challenging to embrace the life of faith. Those are the times when we have to actually wrestle with our faith. Like invite, invite God into the story to help us live the life that he wants. And so I want to spend some time unpacking some, some ways that we might be wrestling with faith. And then what do we do if this is what we're experiencing in our story? And so I think one of the ways that we might simply be wrestling with faith is we kind of look at the implications of what Paul's saying here. Some of his original audience would have been like, Paul, this, this, this doesn't seem fair because like I've been trying to do it right my whole life and, and now you're just saying it's like it's for anyone. And so here's one way that you might be wrestling with faith. Faith doesn't always seem fair. And when I say not fair... Like, I mean that in a couple of ways. Like, like, sometimes faith doesn't seem fair because it can seem like it's just way too narrow. But other times, faith doesn't seem fair because it can seem like it's just way too broad. And so let, let, let's, like, like, look at either side of that. And so let's talk about, like, when faith doesn't seem fair because maybe it seems too narrow. Let's, let's unpack that. So the, the, the idea that, that Jesus is the only way, that's pretty narrow, and it excludes those who don't buy it. That is correct. But don't be upset with me. Take it up with management. Because Jesus is the one who said that. Like John 14, 6. Jesus says these words to his first followers. He goes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And yet here's the thing. Jesus doesn't say that because he's trying to be mean. Jesus says that because he is it. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And what we have to wrestle with is not, is it narrow or not? What we have to wrestle with is he's telling us the truth. Because here's the thing. Any truth claim by definition is narrow. It naturally excludes any other option. Here, let's try this on for size. Two plus two is you narrow-minded people. But we don't get hung up on that because we understand the basic concept, right? And so as we wrestle with what Jesus is saying here, the issue isn't whether or not what he's saying is narrow. The issue is whether or not what he's saying is it true. Because if it's true, then it's the greatest hope we could ever find. And yet we might wrestle with the narrowness of this idea because it rubs against one of the big values in our culture today. And that is the value of inclusivity, right? Like, oh, we, we, we love to be inclusive. We talk about this as a culture, like, let's, everyone's invited. Like, have you ever noticed that everyone likes to be inclusive until you disagree with their value of inclusivity? And they're like, why am I not welcome at the table anymore? I don't understand, but never mind the double standard. But that's the value, right? And so here's some really good news about the gospel. The gospel is radically inclusive. Did you pick up on that when we read Romans 3? Let's just go back. Go back to verse 22, Romans 3, 22. Look at what it says. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to who? All who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's pretty inclusive. All are indicted. And all are invited into the same opportunity of hope. 
I'm like, well, uh, maybe the issue isn't so much that the inclusivity, maybe it's just the issue is that we don't like the message and the implication of the message of the gospel. Well, that's, that has nothing to do with inclusivity. That has to do with the stubborn heart and a stiff neck. That might just be, hey, Jesus, I need to wrestle with you. You might need to do a work in my story. But sometimes we can wrestle with, with uh, our faith because it can not always seem fair because it can seem too narrow. But then there's the whole other side of the equation. Let's talk about wrestling with our faith when it seems way too broad. Because I don't know if you've ever wrestled with this, but this is where it sometimes hits me as I look at this. What about those of us who have tried to be really good people? Do you know anyone who's tried to be a good person? You can raise your hand if that's you. That's okay. I try. I have really good moments in the day sometimes too. Like the first five minutes of my day, whoo! <laughs> and I'm trying to be a good person. And so it doesn't seem fair if I'm understanding what Paul is saying here, that those who live like hell just have to believe and they get all the benefits. Because did you notice what he says in verse five? However, to the one who does not work but trust God who justifies the really good people. No, that's not what it says, is it? Justifies who? The ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. And I, I have an issue with that. I wrestle with that because it's like, like Paul, it, it, sounds like, it sounds like you're just saying like, this is for anyone who wants it. But what about those of us who have worked hard? And I think I wrestle with this because I'm not a millennial. I'm Gen X. We did not get trophies just for showing up. <laughs> like we had to actually compete and practice and earn the trophy. Like I'm a latchkey kid. When we got home from school, no one was looking out for us. We would just roam the playground like a pack of dogs with the other kids. And when you're thirsty, you just drink out of a hose. And you let the other kid go first so they get the warm water so you can hopefully get the cold water, right? Like, like this was us, right? You get a boo-boo, no one's kissing it. You suck it up and carry on. This was my generation. And now you're telling me everyone gets a trophy? Like, Paul, I don't understand. That, this, that doesn't seem fair because I know I'm not like the greatest guy, but I've tried to be a good guy. Like, what's the point? And yet it forces me to wrestle with the question. Maybe this is something for you to think about if you're wrestling with the fairness when sometimes it seems way too broad. Do you really believe you deserve a trophy for the life you've lived? Just sit with that for a minute. Do you really believe that? Because it's an awkward question, right? I mean, if we're just sitting in a, in a corner at Starbucks, maybe we could be honest with one another. We don't have to shout it out here in the room right now. But like, I look at my life and there, there's cer certain things that I'm like, no, that was really good. But then there's other parts of my life and I'm like, well, shoot. I don't think you get a trophy for that. So what do we do with that? How, how do we, because maybe what we need to reckon is that even on our best days, the best of us, still needs serious help. And so look at what Paul writes about this in another one of his letters in Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. He says these words, he says, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ after we had been good enough to deserve it. No, no. God made us alive with Christ even when we were what? Dead. dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Guess what? Dead people don't earn trophies. They're not winning any races because they're dead. And for those of us that wrestle with the, the idea of this doesn't seem fair because it seems too broad, what we have to forget is that we are included in the indictment, even the best of us which means that we need grace and mercy in our story. And so when you're wrestling with this idea of, is this fair? Faith doesn't always seem fair. Here's a question to ask yourself. Do you want to be blessed or do you want to be proud? 
Like, do you want the trophy you think you deserve? Or do you want the grace and the mercy that brings you to life? I've lived with myself long enough to know I don't think I want what I deserve. I want some grace and mercy in my story. I want the God who shows up and says, I love you anyway. And I will do a work in your life. I want to experience what David writes when he says, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. I want that life. Because that's the blessed life. That's the life that leads us to God's righteousness as he puts his righteousness to work in my story. Not because of my goodness, but because of the goodness of my Savior. And that's the life that Jesus promised to lead us, lead us into. Like in John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. And I want to experience the fullness of that life. But then I recognize it's still a life of faith. And, and yet I still will wrestle sometimes with this life of faith because Sometimes I'll look at this life of faith that I'm stepping into. All right, Jesus, I want this fullness of life that you've promised me. I want to experience this, this righteousness that comes from you. It has nothing to do with my own efforts, and I'm going to put my faith in you. So let's go, Jesus, fullness of life. Here we go. And then my life doesn't go the way I want, and I'm kind of like, Jesus, where's the fullness? I, I thought if I signed up with you, if I bought into the timeshare presentation, it would be like my ties and sunsets, how come it's not going the way that I thought? And so sometimes I think we have to wrestle with faith in this way, wrestling with faith, because faith doesn't always seem to work, does it? And by that, I don't mean like God's work in my life. I'm not talking about his side of the equation. I'm just like, I have faith, but it doesn't always seem to work out the way I wanted it to work out. Like, have you ever trust, Have you wrestled with trusting God and it didn't work out the way you thought it was going to go? Anyone? Anyone? Come on. Yeah. yeah. And you're kind of like, have you just ever like honestly asked the question with strong words, what's up with that, God? Like, how come this isn't going the way that I want? Like, what do you do in those moments? Like, do you quit? Do you walk away? Like we saw the ones doing in John 6. How about this? Do you try to fix it your way? Like when God doesn't seem to be getting it right. Like just, just think of the audacity in that moment. Hey, all powerful creator of the universe who's moved heaven and earth to save me, you're kind of dropping the ball. So I'm going to just take this part back and I'll make it work. Oh my gosh. Let me tell you if you could have made it work, you wouldn't have needed him in the first place. And when you try to do it your way, I guarantee you, it's not going to go well. I mean, Abraham experienced this. So you go back in Genesis 15, where Paul's quoting from, right? And like he's quoting, like, Abraham believed God, and it was credited from righteousness. And you just think, this beautiful story, this, this man of deep faith, and he was just chasing after God's dream. You get to Genesis 16, and some time has gone by, and he and his wife are like, God's not fulfilling his promise so now we need to solve it our way. And so here's Sarah, his wife's plan. Sleep with my handmaid, Hagar, have a kid through her, and that will be the child of the promise. And so Abraham, deep man of faith who trusts God, says, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they have a son named Ishmael. And now we have 3,000 years of conflict in the Middle East because Abraham didn't trust God enough to let God do it his way. Wow. And see, I think so often when I find myself striving to live out my faith, oftentimes what I've begun to realize is that I'm actually trying to live out a faith that was never promised to me. Like I want a faith where I, I can expect to always be happy or it will always go my way, or I can only ever expect good times. That's the faith I thought I signed up for. Let me just tell you, that is not the faith promised to us. Like what did Jesus say at the end of John 16 before he goes to the cross? In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Man, if I could have written the Bible the way I wanted it to go. 
he would have said something very different. Like if, I, if it was just my Bible with my pen, it would be like, in this world, it's gonna be awesome because I've overcome the world. Like that, that's what I wish he had said. But that's not what he said, because that's not the truth. We live in a broken world that's in rebellion against God. And so there's gonna be darkness and brokenness in the story. And this world killed him. And then he said, is that all you got? Got back up and said, now follow me because you're on the winning team. In this world, you will have trouble. Take heart, I've overcome the world. Walk with me and I will show you how to overcome. I will show you how to stand tall when it hurts and when it's hard. I will do a work in your story. I love how James puts this, Jesus' brother, James 1.12. And I love what, what he says here because he actually listened to what Jesus said. And James says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. See, when it seems like faith isn't working, it might be that we're flexing the wrong kind of faith. And when we're in that spot, which is tough and it doesn't seem like faith works, here's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Do you want what's been promised or do you want to be petty? And I know that might not sound nice to say it like that, but hear me, whenever we come to God demanding that it go our own way, we're being pretty petty. Because think about the implications of what that means. What we're saying is, hey, Jesus, I know you died horribly to save me. Like, do you remember when he was praying in the garden and, and he's like, he's crying out to the father, hey, is there any other way we can do this three times? Is there any other way we can do this? Is there any other way? Three times he cries out to the father, but every time he says, not my will, but yours be done, right? And so he does that. So Jesus goes to the cross to save a wretch like me. And then a wretch like me comes to Jesus and says, now here's my terms. Like, like I don't come to Jesus and say, here's my writer, I come to Jesus and I say, can you save me? Can you do something for me? My life is laid down, all terms surrendered so I can have life in you. I can have the life that you've come to give me. And see, when pettiness is surfacing in our lives, we need to pay attention because it's revealing a mindset of entitlement. And we need to be careful with that because if we're living with an entitlement, a mindset of entitlement, what we're going to ultimately do is set ourselves up for disappointment and compromise. Because when it doesn't go our way, our natural tendency is to go our own way instead of trusting him to lead us. And when we do that, we actually begin to miss out on what has been promised to us, the righteousness of God that is given to those who believe. That's what's been promised that we have been changed forever and our future is secure because of what God is doing. And so faith says that I will still trust you even when it doesn't seem to be working the way I wanted. And instead of being driven by disappointment and compromise, we now begin to practice gratitude and grit as we continue to trust him and walk with him in the story because we're chasing after what's been promised. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament books of faith in the face of intensity, of faith in a, in a time that it didn't go the way that you wanted, is in the book of Daniel. Daniel is, is a fascinating story. The first six chapters are just the story of Daniel and his friends. And, and Babylon has come and just kind of wiped out their people, taking them in as political prisoners, forcing them to serve in Babylon and do all things Babylonian. And yet what you see consistently in the lives of Daniel and his friends is faithfulness to God in the face of of intense persecution. And in Daniel 3, you see his three friends, these guys whose names have been changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it's this crazy story where the, the king of uh, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, he, he forces all his provincial rulers to come on out to this great plain, and, and he builds this giant statue that's kind of like, hey, look how cool I am, and he's trying to like flex how cool he is. And, and so he said, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have all of my musicians play their music, and when the music plays, everyone needs to bow down and worship my statue. <clears throat> now, if you come from a group of people who have been conquered and Babylon's God has conquered your God, then of course Babylon's God is greater. And so here's the dilemma for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God, our land has been conquered, but we still believe you're greater. 
So what do we do in a situation like this? And so the music plays, and guess what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do not do? They don't bow down. And then word reached Nebuchadnezzar, and he's furious, and he calls them to him, and he's like, unless you do this, I'm going to throw you in this fiery furnace. And I love what they say. Sorry. <coughs> they're there in that moment, standing before the king, and they're like, no. That's, that's the paraphrase. <laughs> I just... They're like, we're not going to serve your gods. We're not going to bow down. And whenever I read those stories, I like to imagine, like, what if I was there with them? Like, just how cool would that be? Like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and little Joel. Here we go, right? <laughs> and we're just in that moment, right? And, like, like the music's playing, and I'm like, guys, are we, what are we doing? Are we, sta- are we standing? Are we, what, oh, we're standing. Okay, okay. We're standing, all right. And then we're like, this is kind of freaky, but it's like, no, we, we, we got this. God's got it. Okay, uh, he seems kind of pissed. <laughs> He's like coming at us. And like, so are we just going to, we're going to bow down physically, but be standing on the inside, <laughs> right? That's, that's the plan. No, no, we're going to stand. He's looking at us and we're going to stand. Okay. And then they start to just lay out their claim of faith and trust in God. Our God will protect us. And inside I'm like, Yeah. Let's go. And then they say, but even if he doesn't, and now I'm like, hold on, what? (laughs) What do you mean if he doesn't? Because I thought if we gave him our life and if we trusted him, it will always go the way that we want. What are you saying if he doesn't? Even if he doesn't, we will never serve your gods or bow down before your statue. That's why I'm not in the Bible. Because <laughs> it would not, Daniel chapter three wouldn't exist if it was just Joel. But the reason that story exists is because the re- these three said no. And then if you know where the story goes, right? Nebuchadnezzar is furious. He ties them up, stokes the flames of the furnace, has them thrown into the furnace. The furnace is so hot that the guys that throw them into the furnace die because of proximity. And then Nebuchadnezzar's looking at the furnace and he's like, wait a second, how many people did we throw in? Three. How many are in there? Four. And it's not because Joel's in the story anymore. (laughs) There's four. Because the God that they stood with stood with them in the furnace. Like, how how do we grow our faith like that? Like in, in the face of those moments where, God, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't seem fair or it doesn't seem to be working. How, how do I still have a faith that says, I stand with you? Because I want what you have come to bring me. How do we grow a faith when we're wrestling with the faith in that moment? How do we flex that kind of faith? And see, if you're going to flex your faith, it's important to remember who you are looking to. Because here's some really good news about this faith thing. It's not about you. Faith is not about what you've done or what you're going to do. Faith is about the one who's already done it and will continue to do it in you. Who will bring you into that life. I love how Paul will write these words in one of his final letters to his protege, Timothy. This is a, a Paul who we're reading about in Romans 4. This is now Paul near the end of his life. And so Paul wanted to go visit Rome because he wanted to share the gospel. So he had a plan for his life. And like, Jesus, let's do this. And Jesus is like, oh, we're going to do it. Very differently than what you think. And if you read through the book of Acts, you realize that Paul w- w- does wind up finally getting to Rome, but he goes as a prisoner. And so now Paul is writing from Rome to his protege, Timothy, to encourage him and teach him all sorts of things. But Paul's pretty sure the time is coming when he's about to be martyred. And so he's writing these words in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 8. And so to Timothy, he says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. 
Instead, to suit their own ears, their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. It's as if Paul knew TikTok was coming. Which is true, right? Like, you can find someone to say whatever you want about God and make you feel good about whatever you want. The question isn't, does it make you feel good? The question is, is it the truth? Is it the truth that sets you free, right? So he says, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. Like he knows he's about to be killed. And like, can you imagine, like now you're Timothy and you're reading this from like your spiritual father, your, your project, and you're reading these words and you're like, he might already be dead by the time you got this letter and we're reading it the first time. And just the weight of what that would mean to see the one that you learned faith from go before you and stand tall in the face of the cost. And so Paul says these words, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And see, here's the faith principle. What you long for shapes who you are living for. And so are you longing for the righteousness that comes from Jesus? Or are you chasing after something else today? You go back to that day in John 6 where his... Some of his followers turn away and stop following him in that moment because it's just too intense. And, and I love what happens next in the end of John 6. Jesus turns to his core group, of his core 12, and he just asks them the question, well, what about you? Do you want to leave too? And that is, I love Peter's response. Peter's response is this. Where else are we going to go? You have the words of life. We believe that you are the Holy One of God. And and I just, I love what Peter says in that moment because Peter's response isn't, no, Jesus, this is awesome. Peter's response isn't, I understand everything you just said. It made perfect sense to me. Peter's response was, I may not understand it. I may not get it. I may not even be sure if I really like it right now, but here's what I do know. I know who you are and that's enough for me because you're the one who is giving life and I want the life you've come to give me. And so Jesus, wherever you go, I will go with you because wherever you're going is my home. So maybe for some of us as we're wrestling with faith today, we've got to learn to flex some faith even in the wrestle. Jesus, I still believe in you. I still trust you. I still follow you. So will you lead me into the life you've come to give me? Would you give me your righteousness as I put my faith in you so that I can step into the life I was created for by the power of your name? And so let's come into his moment on this Thanksgiving weekend and recognize that faith doesn't always seem fair. Faith doesn't always seem to work. But he is good and he has life for us. So let's not miss that. So Lord, we want to come into this moment grateful for what you have done for us even as we wrestle and trying to walk it out with you. So would we have some grit today, some audacity to actually trust you, even in the midst of the things we're struggling with. 
Thank you that as we step into life with you, we can have confidence that there is breakthrough coming in our future because you have already broken through in our past. And you have set us free and set us on the path of life. And so let us continue to follow you. And thank you that as we walk with you, you're with us every step of the way. Your spirit at work within us, both comforting, challenging, empowering, leading us onward. And so as we come into this moment, we want to give you our gratitude for the life you have given us.